Now. This is a big family. And it's good music, too. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. You are family, friends, but really it's family, extended family. And tonight, we're going to say right up front, I want you to know that I am 100% all in and holding this district for the 118th Congress. We're 100% all in and taking back the House, putting a new speaker in, the, in there. And we're gonna be 100% all in and, and fighting for, I mean, we don't have races here in, this, in Nebraska for the Senate, but we're gonna help. Because we wanna see Senator Fisher with a gavel in her hand again, don't we? Yes. <laughs> So right up front, my message is I'm 100% all in. And we gotta be in this district. This district is 37% Republican, 36% Democrat. The rest are unaligned or independent. R plus one officially. I knew when I got elected in 2016, there was no sitting in neutral. It's about hustling day in and day out. There are days, and the staff here will attest to it, we do 15 meetings. That's on the high end, I'll, I'll grant you that. But you can't, you can't leave nothing on the table, and we've never have left anything on the table in any race that we've done. Now, the first race, as the governor mentioned tonight, Governor Heinemann, it was, we were the only challenger to win, to defeat an incumbent. And then 18, there was a 40-seat blue wave that we had to go against. And then at 20, we had our own challenges with suburban America, did not vote for the GOP at the top of the ticket. We've had to overcome all that. We cannot take it for granted this race. We know that we're gonna to have to work our hardest. Now, I like, I like where the winds are blowing, but we cannot take it for granted. I want us to say this to you too, up front. Thank you for allowing me to represent you. I do not take it for granted, and I, and I am grateful to you. I also wanna thank the Lord Almighty, our Heavenly Father. I, it, it does not, not, I don't, I know for a fact that God's been overly graceful to me and my family and frankly our country, but I am grateful to him. So just before I, I have a message tonight that I've worked on, it comes from my heart, I wanted to thank a few people up front. Jimmy Weber, who sang the national anthem, thank you. Yeah. So some of you all know this story, but some don't. I was a major when Jimmy was leading the Air Force Band down at Offutt. I remember when he sang the national anthem, I came up to him as a major. I so said, I felt like I was there at the, you know, the, the battle where, it's, where, the, you know, where it was written. Because he sings it with that intensity and that, and that emotion. And, and who would know that we became such good friends all these years later? So it's a real blessing there. And Tony Connor, where are you at, Tony? There he is. Yeah. And his wife, Linda. We appreciate all the law enforcement here. I've seen quite a few law enforcement here. We've got other first responders, whether it's a fire our firefighters, our ambulance folks who give first aid on the scenes, we thank you. I want to talk a little about really our law enforcement. We touched on it tonight. We saw some terrible news in 2021. 396 police were shot nationally last year, and 63 were murdered. That is unacceptable. But the grand old party it's going to stand with our law enforcement. And it starts making it clear that we support qualified immunity. Now, the other side, Jane Club, the far left Democrat leader, she, she does not like qualified immunity, but she tries to deceive what it is. It's deceptive. She tries to treat it like unqualified immunity, as if a policeman can do whatever they want and be protected. It's qualified immunity. That protects policemen and women who are doing their job right, following the rules, following the procedures. When they do that, then they get protected from trivial lawsuits. And if we don't have that, gang members, other criminals will har harass our police with trivial lawsuits, even though they're doing things by the book. My two opponents, they're not for qualified immunity. 
We know Jane Club's not. We know the leadership in Washington on the Democrat side are not. They want to strip that away. And that is an attack on our police. The Grand Old Party will not do that. We're going to stand with our law enforcement. We're going to stand with Tony. Thanks. And we appreciate our mayor. Just think about this. All major cities in America, almost all of them, are run by the other party. We are blessed to have a Republican running one of the largest cities in America. And look at the difference. We're about number one, number two, number three in almost every category. Whether it's where to raise a family, where to start businesses, education. Our crime rate went down last year, while the rest of the, most of the major cities, it went up. That's a testament to you and really the broader team that we have there. But thank you, Mayor Stother. Thanks for your friendship. And, And Governor Heinemann, I didn't know Governor Heinemann well until I ran for Congress. But you know, I, I like studying history and I like studying military history and politics. He should be a PhD, he's a maven <laughs> in this stuff. But I love getting his advice and his counsel and his friendship and it's fun. Because I, well, we've got some common interest. <laughs> so we appreciate it. Thanks for your, your comments today. First Lady, thank you for being here. Uh, Governor Ricketts did call today, he couldn't make it. I appreciated his support since day one. I appreciate the support now. I appreciate you and your support. S Senator Fisher, a great friend, counselor, advisor. She's on the Ag Committee in the Senate. I'm on the Ag Committee of the House. I'm on the Armed Services Committee in the House. Is she in the Senate? You can't get some, you gotta get something through both houses, right? So we push them, things that we like. And I've been able to get 13 bills signed into law a lot of it because I work with Deb Fisher in the Senate side, helping push our priorities and vice versa. I'm here to support her too. But we are working things in the Ag and the Armed Services together from the House and the Senate. It's a great partnership. And right, I do text her once in a while. She texts back, by the way. <laughs> what I love though is we get, I love the honest candor and advice. And before I go into my main part of my message, I do want to thank Hal Dobb and Mary. Thank you, Mike Foley, for your friendship. We appreciate it. So what's my message today and why I'm running? It is simple. I love our country. We love our country. I'm an American exceptionalist. I believe we live in the greatest country in the world. But you cannot take it for granted. I believe what Ronald Reagan said, we're the shining city on a hill. What shines? It's our freedoms, our rule of law. Equality under the law. We're not perfect because we're human, but we have the best system possible that allows imperfection to be the best that we can. I love what Abraham Lincoln said in the dark days of the Civil War. When he says, as a nation, we are the world's best hope. But ladies and gentlemen, we are under stress. We are hitting tough times. We cannot take it for granted that we can just pass this country on like we've had it. It's gonna to have to be fought for and it's gonna to have to be contended for. I'm here tonight because I love our country and I'm gonna fight for our country because I want our kids and grandkids to enjoy the freedoms, the prosperity, the opportunity that we've only known. So I got two tasks I think tonight that we have to look at what it's gonna to take to get this done. But I'm gonna tell you right up front, I wish it was easier, but these two tasks and the answers are not necessarily cohesive. There's friction, but that's life. There are some ambiguities in life. We take it on. I know that I am up to the task for both of these. You are up to the task for both of these because we love our country. But what is the first task? The first task is we had a president elected last November who ran as a centrist, as a steady hand, but to be candid with you, he's gone full Bernie Sanders. And we have a government where you have a 50-50 Senate and a five-seat minority in the House out of four to three, five seats. And with that, they're trying to transform America. It's not my words. That's the words they're using. They're trying to do it with a 50-50 Senate and a five-seat majority out of four to three, five-seat House. It doesn't, it's not right. 
Basically, the president has embraced the Bernie Sanders Democratic Socialist agenda that he ran on. And the results have not been good. I want you to realize, if we were two more senators short in the Senate today, the filibuster would be gone. The, the Supreme Court would be packed. And we'd have had a Democratic Socialist agenda with not a single Republican vote. That's why this election coming up is so crystal clear. We have a task. It starts right here. We're in one of the most purple districts in the country. We've got to hold this seat. But we're going to have to work with our teammates because we must retake back the House and we must retake back the Senate. Why? To provide a check and balance to our far left agenda as, that we've seen this past year. I want you to know what, what were the results of this past year. We've had the highest inflation rate in 39 years. The average worker has lost $175 in earning power after they get their pay raise because of inflation. The average family of four has lost $350 in buying power. The border is broke. The president is not enforcing the rule of law at the border. We're averaging 200,000 people a month now. It's the worst we've seen in 21 years. That's because the president walked away from three different policies that made our border work in the previous four years. We've seen crime skyrocket. We have to ask ourselves, why did that happen? It's because folks on the other side of the aisle, I'm not saying all, but some of the leaders, to include the top Democrat in Nebraska, denigrate our law enforcement, denigrate the rule of law. And Americans are worried about it. Thankfully, we live in a much better city than what many are seeing right now. I want to talk about Afghanistan. Americans saw what happened this August, and it was one of the most disgraceful, humiliating things our country has gone through. You know, we, were, we had 3,500 troops in Afghanistan, in garrison, not in combat. We, have take, we had zero combat losses for a year and a half. And the president decided just to pull them out. Even though we were providing air power, within 10 minutes we could put bombs on target supporting the Afghan government. We were maintaining their aircraft, the Afghan aircraft that were flying missions. We pulled their mechanics away. We were providing logistics to get bullets to the frontline troops, and we pulled that away. I, I asked the general, the four-star general in charge of CENTCOM, what did you expect when you pull away your air power and mechanics? He says, I expected them to collapse, but not in two weeks. But yet our president said we were gonna, they were going to maintain power for at least two years, that we were going to get rid of them, we were going to get Americans home. We have hundreds of Americans still in Afghanistan. Thousands of interpreters still in Afghanistan. Broken word from the White House. It was one of the most humiliating things I think this country's gone through. But Americans know it. When you look at what happened in Virginia, a 12% swing in one year. New Jersey, a 14-point swing. We have wind at our backs because the Americans see the reality of what's going on. But we cannot take it for granted. We're going to have to work our hardest all the way between now and November to provide that check and balance. But that's our first task. Here's the second task. And we're gonna have to figure out how to put this together. Our country has been the world's superpower. We are the shining city on a hill. But China's economy is slowly surpassing us. If they're about 95% of our economy, they're growing about 6% a year. We've been averaging 2%, a little higher coming out of COVID. What's going to happen if China surpasses us economically and then beyond? There's technologies out there that they are ahead of us right now. Hypersonics, some portions of artificial intelligence. They're investing 9% of their GDP on their infrastructure to make the most world-class, state-of-the-art ports in the world so they can beat us economically. And I ask you, what is the world going to look like in 20 years or 30 years if by chance they are the superpower? We have been the shining city on a hill because of our values. They don't share our values. I'm not about the Chinese people. I embrace the Chinese people. It's the communist government that I'm referring to. They do not share our values. They're committing genocide against the Uyghurs. They are persecuting Christians. 
They, they, there's been five people I know of at Wuhan that just disappeared because they were telling the truth. So we're the shining city on a hill, but if, if they replace us, that void will not be filled with our values. So my message here today is, and the second task, we're going to have to get our house in order. We're going to have to start working together if we want to maintain the world's superpower, be the voice for freedom. So we got two tasks. Fight for our values and what we believe in that made our country great, but also be Americans so that we can grow and be strong and competitive so that our kids and grandkids have what we've always enjoyed. I'm up to the task. When you look at my values, I've been rated 100% pro-life, 100% Second Amendment, 100, I'm 100% all Bill of Rights, I love them. 100% support for, for small business, that's what I've been rated on. 100% by the farmers, and 100% by faith coalitions. Those are my values that represent our values. I'm a federalist. I believe power should stay at the local level. I want to keep power of Mayor Stother to the max extent possible. I'm out of federal government. I believe in peace through strength. I believe that the family is the most important institution in our country. But I've also shown that I can work across the aisle because America has to come first. The Center Ground Committee has rated me the number one elected official in America for reaching common ground. Georgetown's rated me 15 out of 40 to 35 for seeking bipartisanship. The Chamber has said I was two years in a row the number one GOP in the House for seeking consensus. We got to do both. By the way, we have, with that and with our friendships and partnerships, we've delivered great results. We've restored. The money is there to restore Offutt Air Force Base, the second largest employer. We worked that very hard. And I worked with Doug Fisher Metzley, also Jeff Fortenberry, who is on the approach committee. We've restored Camp Ashland. We have worked together, again, I have a look at Doug on a lot of these issues here, the Senate House duo, to reauthorize the Chippet Act for the VA so we can now do the inpatient facility and, re and modernize that. Through my work in the Ag Committee, but through support with Doug Fisher, we were able to stand up the foot and mouth disease vaccine bank, an initiative I had in the House side. Because we ever had an outbreak, our trade, our beef and pork trade would be shut down for five years. We need that insurance policy. This year it becomes operational. Homegrown right out of Nebraska here, I may say, at our Ag Committees. Four years ago, I also saw where the Homeland Security was failing to pass intelligence data and stuff to the states, the governors, I was able to get legislation passed that standardized for all 50 states what the responsibilities of Homeland Security is in supporting the states, and that is law. I can give you, I won't go through all my 13 bills, but I will say I'm most proud that when I was elected five years ago, the readiness of our military was the lowest, lowest it had been in 40 years, and we have turned that around. Our men and women in uniform deserved that. Right. So, right. so, before I close, as I say, it's so, so humbling to be here. It is. I was raised on a farm, oldest of nine kids. My first job was, besides mowing grass, was scooping the manure. <laughs> I pinched myself. I wonder, Lord, what happened, but I thank you for it. I close on this tonight. We're in this because we love our country. And we know that we have. We have the greatest country in the world, and we cannot take it for granted. And yes, we have a red versus blue problem tonight. And we're going to fight for our values and principles. The principles that made America the greatest country in the world. We're not going to retreat from them. But we also know that we've got to put Americans first. We hear America first, I'm saying we got to put Americans first to know that we got to stand together because we got to make progress if we want to make our country the most competitive and powerful country and keep that in the world. So tonight, my message is, yes, on this red versus blue, I'm fighting for the principles of the red team. But let's not forget that we need more red, white, and blue. Thank you very much.
Appreciate you guys.